I'm a uh, Frankie Buck Professor of Finance Emeritus at Stanford University, uh, Stanford, California. I've been uh, teaching and doing research in uh, economics and particular uncertainty in finance uh, since uh, the 1960s. Mr. Schultz, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, it has been more than four decades since Black Schultz was first published. What has been the evolution of derivative markets in these last decades? I can't uh, believe that it's 40 years now <laughs> that <laughs> that has occurred. I must be getting old, so I have to think about that as a possibility. Actually, uh, the, uh, when we initially uh, thought about pricing derivatives and thinking about derivatives, uh, it was more from an academic perspective and trying to explain how to price existing contracts. Uh, over time, uh, because of derivatives and knowing how to use option pricing technology, we have had a tremendous growth in the new applications and uses of option pricing technology and derivatives. Uh, that occurrence or that evolution was a really a surprise to me, is how once you have a technology, once a technology exists, that technology could be used very broadly in many different new applications. The technology that uh, Fisher Black and I develop will still continue to be the groundwork or the basis for which uh, new applications and new uh, evolutions of the technology occur. The, uh, when we have the Black-Scholes model, the Black-Scholes model was a way to have an analytical solution for a general technology. Anyone who's gone forward to develop new breakthroughs has used the basic fundamental technology uh, to do such. Uh, and that we always knew that the model was an incomplete description of reality. Given it was an incomplete description of reality, then that means that many uh, new uh, uses or new ways of formulating the models were built, but on the underlying basic technology. So we can still expect new developments. Sure. Okay. Um, ever since 2008 crisis, derivatives industry has become a heavily regulated industry. Can regulation curtail or put a break on the growth of derivatives markets? Uh, yes, I think it can. Obviously, too much regulation or too heavy regulation uh, will cause costs to increase. That means the markets won't be as efficient as they might be. And certain lower risk contracts that have very little profit but need a lot of capital or very heavily compliance regulation will disappear even though they're very valuable. The problem with regulation, it's applied uniformly across all types of derivative contracts, all types of instruments, and therefore the ones that do survive or grow are the ones that can overcome the regulatory costs. Do you think that regulation will loosen up in years to come? We always go through cycles in our society. Sometimes we have very heavy regulation. Prior to 1970s, 70, uh, there was very heavy regulation and things and finance didn't change very much for many years. After 70, we had uh, regulation tended to become much looser and markets became freer. Um, and uh, that growth in freedom of markets and trusting markets and market prices grew until the 2008 crisis. After the 2008 crisis, the amount of regulation of banks and the amount of regulation of other financial providers has increased dramatically. That will slow the growth of 
use of finance will slow the growth. But it means that what will happen is the old institutions, the way we uh, provide financial functions and services to the economy will change. I think that is why we're seeing a movement to what we would call shadow banking markets or exogenous banking markets that are not related to those institutions that are regulated by the government. That takes time to evolve. So evolve. shadow banking will increase in the next years, in your opinion? Yes. Uh, uh, the internet will be a great growth vehicle. I think I see that the internet is changing exponentially the way financial functions are provided and it will continue to grow exponentially in the future. So it'll, the internet and dispersed, distributed ways of uh, undertaking financial activities will uh, grow and that's through the internet which will then compete more and more with the standard organizational forms that we know today. As a follow-up of these that you have mentioned, then do you expect a growth, an important growth in the fintech industry? Yes, obviously that's what I was referring to. The financial technology um, and uh, big data, you know, blockchains, all sorts of other ways of providing financial services and functions will gravitate uh, to that. What can we expect? in terms of innovation in the next years? Well, the way, I, the way I see it is that we've had innovation in every dimension of finance that's grown for so many years. Every year there's new innovations mm -hmm. and new way, and it's really innovating in ways to provide the functions. So we have, what's going to happen is that in the past, we've had all the data has been owned by a financial institutions, such as the bank. That data is owned by the bank. And the bank acts in a way to try to clear transactions. That's their business. And uh, so it's, the world is based on transaction processing. And the future is going to become transaction analyzing. So the data, big data, data on transactions are going to be very important. The way the world is going to grow dramatically and innovate in the years ahead is the data. The more people have access to data, whether it's through the internet, is the major source of data dissemination, then you have an inclusive societies around the world. An inclusive society means that anyone who's in a small town, say, in Mexico, can interconnect with me in Palo Alto, California, at Stanford University. And that interconnectivity or that data will change the whole nature of how goods are sold, goods are made, goods are processed, transactions occur, and the whole nature of finance. The change in data availability. So in your area, which is derivatives and derivative trading innovation, it's risk management and risk transfer. The demand for risk transfer services will increase dramatically, and instead of it being risk transfer for large corporations and banks, it'll become risk transfer more for the individual or more for small businesses, more for those dispersed activities. So we always think about going from the small to the big to be efficient. But it seems that the world is going to go from the big now down to the small again. Which in the future has to be based on more a dynamic belief in how markets work and how distributions uh, unfold. Most of risk management technology is based on looking backwards, not looking forward. And I do believe that there's huge amounts of information in market prices, in particular in option market prices, about what the forward distribution of risks are, at least as gleaned by the market. And so risk management systems, whether have to uh, move in the direction of uh, forward information, which is contained in derivative contracts, and not so much just looking and back because most people when thinking about risk are akin to driving a car 
they look in the rear view mirror and they define what the risk of the road ahead is. But obviously that is not very good because the risk of the road ahead is the same as the risk of the road behind, only if the risk of the, uh, the road ahead is the same as the road behind, and that's not true. So the fact is risk management has to become more proactive as opposed to being reactive to historical data. Do we need more forward-looking vision in risk management markets nowadays? We have a lot of information already that exists that have huge forward markets for risk, and the forward markets, in particular in the option markets, have uh, uh, myriad uh, pieces of information okay. about risk. Um, Mexico has an emerging hedge fund industry, in part because the legal framework doesn't foresee exactly what we call hedge funds in other parts of the world. How important is the development of a mature hedge fund industry for a country? Well, the, um, I don't know whether it's necessary to have hedge funds or asset management firms and the like. It, what is the function that a hedge fund is performing that can't be performed in other activities or other vehicles? So if there are constraints in Mexico which prevent banks from providing the intermediation services or pension funds or other entities that exist today, uh, then it's the case that those functions, uh, intermediation functions, have to be provided by someone else. And so the hedge fund vehicle has grown as a way to do things what that could not be done within the banks or organizations. So as the regulation has increased, as regulation has extended and expanded, then it's the case that um, people who have been in proprietary trading or trying to be in intermediation services have left the banks, have left organizations to set up their own shops or shops that don't have the uh, one shoe fits all constraints that exist within financial institutions. So functions that are being provided, the intermediation function in particular, that is being provided by hedge funds is a very valuable service and therefore should be fostered because if you have good intermediation service in the country, prices are more efficient, markets work better, and liquidity is provided to markets, and markets function in a more efficient manner. Okay, here we are in the context of this event organized by the pension fund industry in Mexico, the Afores. Uh, in your opinion, in, and in as much as you're familiar with our pension fund industry, which has grown and has become more robust, what challenges lie ahead for the pension fund managers in Mexico? I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in providing investment services to clients is trying to understand clients' risk posture, trying to understand what risk they want, how it evolves over time what type of risk posture should we provide to savers or pension savers and how do we garner that information to provide it to them. We have done a lot of work on the investment management side but we haven't done very much work on understanding what it is that's, that the client wants and what it is that the client needs and what it is that how to educate the client on how to think about risk and risk management and what types of risk to take in growing assets for their retirement. And especially when it comes, you have interventions where uh, employees withdraw money and then have less savings for the future. What is the savings function? What is the savings function? How that is going to evolve over time? There's a lot of research, a lot of thinking to think about what is the correct modeled what is what is it what what is it that the saver really wants in terms of accumulation what is it they want in terms of risk posture how does it evolve over time therefore what type of services or products to offer to them to solve those particular problems uh, so do you think that uh, customer and client education should be a priority for the pension fund industry in, in our country it, it goes hand in glove with 
actually managing the money. Okay, so let's talk about the professionals in the fund, in the pension fund industry, given all these challenges and um, given that you have been an academic. How important is education and especially continuous education in the latest insights, in the latest approaches from the best in the discipline? One of the reasons why you have conferences such as this, a forest conference, is basically for educational purposes and learning and getting to meet people so you can learn from them through discussion. So we have a, a, a tremendous amount of information now available for education of professionals. It's not, it's when I first started in teaching you had a, a piece of chalk and a board and you uh, use that to educate with. Nowadays, it's, you have the internet, you have continuing education, you have many periodicals and books which allow for there to be information transfer, knowledge transfer. The issue becomes how do you create a, a system to sort out the good from the bad and to really think about best practice. And that has to be done in conjunction with you know, uh, self-organizing learning groups and figuring out what it is that would be beneficial for provision of investment services. Okay, um, Mr. Schultz, in order to start wrapping up the, the interview, um, we have seen a lot of volatility in markets in the, in the latest weeks. Do you expect this trend to continue in the next few weeks or months? Well, it seems so that, um, you know, that volatility uh, estimates in the market now seem to be more more conservative, less downside than they were previously. So um, uh, it depends a lot on um, on what potential uh, events could shock the market. Uh, you know, I think that my worry for going forward is that we could see an inflation scare. You know, the market risks tend to be in forward estimates of risk tend to be indicating that that's a real possibility going forward. Um, and so we do not know what the central bankers are going to do or government policy is going to be doing in the next number of months, which could create changes in expectations. But currently, the option markets tend to be indicating relatively uh, calmer periods ahead. Whether that changes quickly, we'll have to see. Um, specifically about Mexico and in, in as much as you are familiar with our economy, what is your forecast or your expectation of Mexican economy? Well, obviously that, uh, I think that uh, I am not really an expert on the Mexican economy. There's so many economies to follow. I think that uh, basically um, there will be a lot more government spending in the United States after the election, regardless of who wins the election. And uh, to that extent, uh, infrastructure spending it probably would uh, favor uh, Mexican exports. Um, and I think that basically uh, the trouble in, uh, with the Mexican economy or worrying about the Mexican economy is you know the need to let markets work, the need to really let uh, things flourish, and um, given uh, constraints of running a country, uh, that tends to be impeded from time to time. And so, with freeing up the economy and letting it do its own thing, and with the growth of the internet, as I think, you know, I do see that uh, you know, Mexico has a great entry point not only to the uh, United States, but to the rest of uh, Latin and South America. Mr. Schultz, thank you very much. It has been a great interview, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Audio Jungle. Audio Jungle.